What's up, Liron here, and today I'm going to show you how to use warm and cool colors to improve your paintings. What's up, Liron here. Thank you for joining me in another video. Today I want to talk to you about warms and cools. Uh, I did this painting process that I'm really uh, uh, pleased with and there's a lot of warm and cool play here that I think will be beneficial to talk about, uh, especially in the stages done wet and wet. So what I did was set up two cameras so you can see two angles that are very interesting, one from the top and one from the side using my phone. Uh, I think the video captured here is really interesting and it will show you um, a lot of things related to the behavior of the paint and also the behavior of mixes of warms and cools, okay? So without further ado, let's get started. So now I'm starting with the drawing process and I feel like I really nailed this one because uh, the drawing is uh, sufficient and it's not more than sufficient, it's just good, it shows everything, all the large shapes. Um, I don't know if it's this scene or something else, but uh, I had a really easy time interpreting it. Sometimes you just click with some kind of a view and it just looks... Uh, a way that attracts you. So I'm not changing the composition, I'm not changing anything, I love the way this looks. Uh, if I'm not changing, at least I'm not changing uh, uh, on purpose. Maybe I will change something by mistake. Uh, but in any case, uh, so this is this uh, shadowed corridor here uh, and I'm trying to make sure I leave enough room on the left for the that wall uh, that's close to us, that has a lot of details on. Uh, and now through the arch you can see all of these buildings in the background. Uh, and now I'm measuring where the arch should reach, and it's this point, and then I'm drawing it. Okay, and this is really useful. Uh, you have to measure sometimes, otherwise you just get everything skewed. And, and especially with these kinds of rounded shapes, uh, I find that I really have to measure. Um, so what, what you see now is really very weak lines just to set up the general proportions of, of the buildings and the arch and the buildings inside the, the kind of tunnel that is created. Um, so it's just set to set up the, the, the general, let's say, elements. Um, and based on that we will start doing some more detailed work. Now usually I don't show the entire drawing process but this process itself wasn't that long so it wasn't like an hour and a half or two hours it was uh, about um, I think 40 minutes or something like that. By the way I have no idea how it ended up being so short. Uh, I think I just was able to get a lot of things done in the very first steps and uh, the balance turned out to be really well. So yeah. Uh, now I moved this line a bit because I felt like there... because as you look at the reference there is a difference there. You see where the shadow ends there's still yet to go with the red floor uh, until you get to the buildings in the background. So now I'm starting to strengthen the lines. Uh, this line may be a little crooked, but also don't forget that you see a bit of a skewing due to the angle uh, of the paper, of the camera. Okay, it, it pushes everything that's down uh, the, at the bottom part, it squeezes it. Okay, uh, so anyway, now moving on, starting with the from top to bottom. Generally, I work top to bottom, left to right, just like if I would be inking, uh, because I don't want to smear the pencil too much. But with painting, it's not that big of an issue, so you may see me traveling more uh, around the paper than I than if I would have uh, when I would have used a pen. Um, just solely. And, and especially with this kind of rough paper, uh, I think it's really helpful for protecting the pencil lines. But then they wash off once you put some layers of paint, uh, as long as you're not using a really hard lead. Um, and, and that's fine with me too, by the way. So we've got a bit of a perspective going on and you want to make sure that you get all of the lines in perspective properly. Uh, perspective basically dic dictates that every all parallel lines converge to the same point, to the same vanishing point. Uh, so that means that the roof, the line representing the rooftop uh, and all the, the different, um, different uh, you know, um, 
architectural details. <laughs> it took me some time. All of the uh, horizontal architectural details will converge into the same point. Also, the tunnel itself converges to that same vanishing point. So you just want to make sure uh, you get that in. Uh, I believe I do have a few videos on perspective that you can check out. Uh, I cover all of these things much more extensively in my beginner's drawing course. So def definitely check that out if uh, you're interested in that. I'm stuttering a bit today. I don't know why. <laughs> but in any case, yeah, it's all covered there. Now, one of the things that really attracts me to this scene is the sharp angles here of the light that's it's just so pretty that uh, I really wanted to get that in um, and uh, it just looked like a good opportunity to try to to play around with very strongly saturated oranges and yellows and reds and then contrasting them with blues and maybe some purples uh, so this is what I was generally trying to achieve now you see the that triangle of light uh, ended up being too large so I'm just making it smaller it, it started reaching the window itself so yeah uh, by the way uh, a lot of this drawing phase is just being uh, very concentrated you know you many times if I get a drawing inaccurately uh, it's not due to lack of skills it's just lack of patience or lack of focus uh, so these things are really I think it's also a trained skill you know to be focused and to be really present when you're working on the drawing uh, I especially learned this now that I'm focusing a bit more on portraits um, it's just you have to be really uh, really focused and really there uh, otherwise you won't get the result you want now notice how if I would have made this just a pencil drawing I would have included much more details. I'm being really uh, sparse with the details, putting in just the bare minimum of what I need to know what to do. Uh, I'm trying to shade some areas very gently just so that I remember later on in case I forget, but this is just for me to see the composition of light and shadow to make sure now I missed this line so I'm putting it in. Uh, it's a line of shadow actually, this is, which is why I'm putting it in. Um, just to get a good look at how it will look with the main shapes and I think the one of the things that really makes a scene is a lot of large shapes that you can uh, build a composition upon. Many times you look at a view and you ask yourself how the hell am I supposed to deduce this into a painting? What should I include? What should I leave out? Um, if you squint your eyes you will get a better picture and then you can see do I see a lot of large shapes here? Uh, and if you do, <coughs> then good news, you can probably base a, a nice painting on that. Um, so uh, what's good in this one is that there's a lot of large shapes. I decided, by the way, to make this shadow here a little uh, more dominant towards the bottom. Um, because it looked to me like it's wrapping the scene nicely. So I made it longer and I made sure to avoid it pointing to the, to the corner of the page. Okay, that sometimes can ruin things. Um, so yeah. So in any case, for me, this entire scene is one large shadow on the archway uh, and then just the highlights on the sides of the building and on the floor and then the staircase there in perspective with all of the nice little uh, details and that's it. So um, uh, it's really, you know, that's the main thing for me. So the larger shapes really help you base a good drawing off of them. So now we can finally start with uh, the, the paint and I'm taking, again, an approach that's a bit different from what I usually do. I really go slow this time and try and get everything in, all of the variety in war, in temperature and in color and in value. I try to get a bit more of it inside here. Now, <coughs> if you're going to try and make, you know, a painting a la prima just with one go, one layer, get everything that's dark, dark, everything that's light, light, first off, it's all going to be mashed together together because it's the first wash and things are very wet so that could be a problem and second it'll just take so long and then some areas will start drying on you and it's not going to be a good experience at times so I'm trying to get as much as possible but not everything I'm not um, deluding myself that I will be able to get everything so now I'm putting a bit of, you see that, that will create a lot of beauty here. I put a bit of burnt sienna on the top and then uh, a mix of uh, blue and red on the bottom to create this purple. Uh, the paints I'm using are very simple. I'm just using uh, Thalo Blue, which is actually Windsor Blue. That's because it's Windsor Newtons, uh, but it's Thalo Blue. Um, and then we've got a quinacridone rose. I may use a bit of cadmium or pyrrole scarlet, which is kind of cadmium-ish red, uh, and burnt sienna. So it's a lot of yellows and and um, and uh, reds, and then just a bit of the the thalo blue uh, here and there. Okay. <coughs> so now, sorry about that. 
uh, if I sound in a hurry, that's because this video should have been out like a few hours ago and I barely made it because I had tons of other things to do. Um, and also because I was just working on, on it for a long time. Um, so, so apologies about that. And even if I'm in a hurry, it doesn't matter because I have to narrate the whole thing. So in any case, uh, now you can see that second angle I recorded with my iPhone. Uh, I hope you like that touch. Sometimes I'll, I'll kind of alternate between the two. Um, so now I'm adding a bit of the crinacridone rose and you can see it really up close. Just a beautiful, beautiful color and we just covered it in the paint show, so uh, even better. And you see I'm just traveling across the paper. Uh, now this highlight, I'm gonna blend it out. I'm gonna do that in just a moment. Um, I don't want any white highlights because I find that it's still hard for me to make them look good. They just seem out of out of out of the color scheme for some reason. Sometimes I, I used I did have a good time period where I did use them and it tur they turned out nicely, but for some reason I can't get them to look nicely like for the life of me. So I'm avoiding that for now. No white highlights at all. It's just gonna be a very light uh, initial wash that will allow me to use some of it as a highlight. And you'll see soon. And remember, watercolor dries much lighter than, than it appears right now, so uh, that's important to uh, just to take into consideration because don't worry if it looks really dark now, it's gonna be much lighter uh, later on, okay? So that's something important uh, to have in mind. In terms of the materials I'm using, because I'm always asked about it, um, it's uh, silver black velvet brushes, sizes 12 and 8, uh, and the paper I'm using is Saunders Waterford. Uh, I wasn't sure if I'm gonna get that by the way that's patch of sky in but I decided to do it I'm just lifting back some of the paint here it's a bit too dark uh, lifting just coming back with a dryer brush and picking up some of the paint um, it acts like a sponge so in any case uh, I decided to put that blue patch in because I just thought it would look good uh, sometimes I'm just trying things out and, and if I'm lucky it works. Uh, but in any case, the silver black velvet brushes, sizes 8 and 12. What you see now is the size 12 if I'm not mistaken. Um, the paper is Saunders Waterford, uh, 300 grams. It is cold pressed, my favorite paper. I barely use hot pressed. I love the texture. I always love texture. Um, and you can see it in the bottom now with them. when I'm using the brush. It leaves a bit of a kind of a white trail. I love that. Um, the paints I'm using, again, are mostly Daniel Smith, except for the Windsor Newton Blue. Now remember, uh, now it's all dry and you can see the difference, it's much, much lighter. Uh, I just want you to, to put it to context, the materials really don't matter. Uh, I see some amazing artists, local artists here in Israel that uh, use like the Windsor Newton Cotman, which are uh, student grade, because sometimes you do a demo for a student and you're using their paints uh, and also just generally he uses it from time to time he did a monochromatic uh, with uh, burnt umber and it turned out amazing with Winsor Newton's Cotman series uh, so the materials don't get too hung up on it it doesn't matter um, as long as you're comfortable with them you know uh, and like my, my interview with Steve popped this topic as well it's like I wouldn't hurry to to replace student grade with professional artist grade until I actually notice the difference. If you don't notice the difference, it doesn't really matter. So anyway, now I'm starting with the shadows, one of my favorite parts as well. Um, every part of the, every stage of the painting is, is lovable to me in some way. You know, the initial wash, you can be free. Then the, the second wash, now I'm trying to figure out if I cover everything and I think I decide to leave just a bit of a highlight there. Um, the second wash is where you define the shapes using the shadows, which is another stage I love. Uh, because, come on, look at it. It's so fun. It's like the, the shadows are the best, uh, really. So, uh, and you also, on the one hand, you have to hurry. But on the other hand, the areas on which you're working are more limited in size, which allows you more reaction time. It allows you more time to th think things through. And so, so that's a good thing, you know. Uh, so in any case, now I'm switching, notice the, this transition from uh, Burnt Sienna to the Windsor Blue mostly with a bit of the, uh, I think it's a bit of the Quinacridon Rose, but maybe also a bit of uh, Carbazole Violet has spilled into it, which I love. Carbazole Violet, again, another one by Daniel Smith. Uh, when I go up there, I go back to some Burnt Sienna because I want to create that variation. I'm really interested in it. Now notice the building on the left where I stopped the wash. I'm very aware of the fact that this edge is about to dry. So while I'm working on this part, I'm still focusing in my peripheral thoughts on this part on the left as well. And in any part that is about to dry, uh, for that matter. Uh, you have to be aware of these things. 
Now, I'm shading this using heavy, heavy orange. Uh, and the reason why is that I want to preserve the warmth here. And something I would have, I, I did a lot in the beginning, which was a big mistake, was to gray things out too much. I would just, everything would look gray and sad. Then I went up one notch and I started using warm, warm and cool colors. But I would use, always, always, I would use blue for shadows. And the problem with that is that it would just blue the entire painting up or it would gray it out because I have one layer of yellow and then one notice this uh, wet and wet action by the way it's a beautiful stage I love that part uh, very thick paint so that it can actually negate the the dry the wetness of the area when you go wet and wet you have to go back with a strong paint to get an effect because it's so wet so it's gonna dilute um, so back to the point I used to use just blue for all the shadows and it would create a very boring uh, look and sometimes it would also gray things out but then I went in the final metamorphosis uh, and became a butterfly and that's when I really realized that um I should be using oranges and yellows and reds for the shadows as well for the areas that I wanted to keep warm because if I wouldn't have done that it would immediately turn into a gray or a blue or something like that um, and I don't want that uh, so anyway now I'm um, moving on. Notice, by the way, the contrast with the, the window. I love the way this looks. Um, I don't know why. The moment I started recording this, my nose became a bit uh, irritable <laughs> for some reason. By the way, I think I lost that edge on the left. Um, I don't know what I was thinking about. Uh, but Or maybe I sprayed some water on it so it's still wet and I haven't noticed. Sometimes I will use a spray. Uh, so it was still a bit wet, not completely, but it started drying, but still not enough for me to lose the wetness, as you can see here up close. Uh, maybe I used a spray for that. Uh, so a spray is like magic, you can lengthen the, the time of your wash, uh, you can keep it wet for a little longer, and it really, really helps. It actually, it's actually a good tr uh, trick, uh, especially if you're covering large washes. Now notice how patient I am and how focused I am, I'm really taking my time figuring out what should look how. Um, and I was using a very wet wash to begin with, so that's a good thing, by the way. Um, another common mistake I used to make was uh, I would make the second layer very thick and, and dry, and it's too early. You have to go with a wet wash sometimes as a second wash as well. So now I s things started graying out, so I'm switching to a blue, to a, something that will give me some more color in there. Um, and this is under the arch, so I I have no problem making this very cool, a very cool area. Now I just want to get that shape uh, perfectly in, so I'm I'm gonna be working a bit slowly here. Um, there are some areas where you can kind of work fast and not worry too much, but this is this the the arch itself is an important area, so I really want to figure out what I'm doing and where I'm doing it. Now just a very thick paint to do some wet and wet here to indicate that architectural detail. Uh, that's really important. Uh, again, to get it while the wash is still wet. Uh, moving on with the wash, kind of a brown, you know, mix of all of the colors. And I will strengthen out, straighten, sorry, uh, out some of the lines on the left. They're a bit crooked. I'm going to fix that because it is an important line uh, to make sure that it's straight. I Hopefully I will. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so now with the shadow on the floor. Now the floor is very red. Um, so I thought I would start reddening it uh, a bit just to include some more... I guess to make it shine a little more. Sometimes I find that if the, the surrounding shines with bright bright color, it's very useful to use that color in the shadow as well, which makes sense because in the shadow, it's still that color. It's just obscured by the shadow. Uh, so now I was uh, having a bit of um, a hard time mentally of figuring out how I want to approach the background there. So you see I added a bit more water because it was a bit too strong. Now I think it's a bit too weak, so I'm going to add a bit more paint. Uh, it's something that I really want to keep back there and really give the, the impression that it's way back. Um, I don't wanna, I don't want to have too many highlights there. It's all just fading off. Uh, so that's the effect I was going for here. And I think I got it. I think I... I hit this one pretty nicely. Uh, I also think it could have worked uh, okay to leave some highlights there to pull the attention to the to the center. Um, 
I, th I actually think, I just figured it out now, it could have been a really good idea to do that. Uh, by the way, now I'm just playing around with the photo on my, on my Mac, trying to move to the area I'm working on, uh, because I really had to go zoom in here to really see what's going on. Uh, sometimes you really have to zoom in and paint larger and work in more details, you know. Uh, many times it's hard to get a lot of details in, and then you figure out that you're working really, really small. And of course you wouldn't be able to get the details you want in. Um, so yeah. Now this may look like a big blob to you now and something that's really incoherent, uh, but the more we will add shadows and the larger shapes will be done, uh, you will see how this slowly uh, comes together. Uh, I started with a blue and then I figured out this should be warm. So I added a bit of burnt sienna. Uh, one note about burnt sienna and phthalo blue, they usually don't play nicely together. Uh, I find that they, unlike French ultramarine, they lead to very sad, I think, grays uh, in many cases. So I'm trying to avoid that direct mixture. Um, you will see it from time to time, like here in this area. But overall, and it is quite a gray area to be frank. Um, but overall, I'm trying to avoid it uh, when possible. So now I have to be careful because the, the left part of this wash is still not completely dry and I'm moving in with wet paint. Um, by the way, I was asked about how the second wash does not pick up the, uh, the first wash, does not uh, reactivate it. Uh, I will reply to that specific comment. I don't remember who's, who asked it, but I will reply to it. But I'm also replying here. Um, just by working really fast and also the paper can have influence on it. So if you're constantly frustrated uh, that you can't get it, uh, to look the way you want to. Uh, it may be also an issue with the paper. I would recommend trying the same thing on a more high quality paper. Um, generally speaking, a second wash shouldn't reactivate the first one too much. Uh, the, Steve Mitchell from The Mind of Watercolor actually has a great video w in which he compares a lot of types of paper. Uh, and, and this is the number one fault he finds in the cheaper papers, that the second wash or the third wash always reactivates the previous one. Uh, it's like the, the paint tends to s just stick around on the top part uh, of the paper and not really be absorbed. And, and that's really an issue at times. So if this is an issue that plagues you, I'm gonna reply again to your comment, uh, but <laughs> but you just got a personal personalized uh, answer here in the video. Um, I may also demo this. This is actually a good idea for video. I'll, I'll write it down for myself uh, in a few moments. Um, so yeah, it's just how to avoid reactivating it. I think it's a good idea for a video. Um, so yeah, now I'm putting in those details and it, these details will really add a lot of grace. You will see later on. Um, I wasn't expecting them to be that good, uh, but they did their, their job really well. And um, it's so funny how, you, you know, you put a lot of effort into the rest of the details, but then this is the thing that people see sometimes when they first glance at your painting. Uh, but actually what makes this beautiful is not this um, metal barred fence. Uh, it's actually the larger shapes and, and the, the larger details is usually what turns um, a painting into something beautiful. It's, it's almost always the large shapes. Now notice how I'm getting a variety in that shadow, just for the sake of variety. There isn't really a science, you know. I get asked sometimes uh, how I choose the, the color, the specific color. Uh, I also asked Nitin this uh, in the interview I did with him. He's a fantastic watercolor painter. Highly recommend you check out his work. Um, and it's so random and intuitive, really. Uh, I personally don't have a set method of, uh, I think my phone rings but I'm just gonna ignore it because this is more important now. Uh, so uh, I don't really have a method for choosing a paint or something that it's really instinctive and on the spot and uh, just the way, the way uh, I feel at that particular moment. So sorry if there was a weird cut. I did end up taking a sh short break to blow my nose basically because it, it was starting to bug me. Um, so, and I also took a look at the conversation, making sure it's not too important. Uh, so back to business. Uh, now comes the really interesting part where I'm putting in the, the details of the dry brush uh, on the left. Um, and notice how this is just meant to contrast with all the rest of the um, very wishy-washy 
uh, wishy-washy. That's I'm not even sure if that's the right way of. But in any case, you get my point. With the very blended, very um, f- um, soft feeling on the right, uh, I wanted to negate that, uh, or maybe complement it with some uh, harsher strokes, some more uh, details. They are just done a little sharply. Now I'm gonna put in some wet and wet and notice how I'm picking up a relatively thicker paint because I do want that wet and wet to show. Uh, and you can really, if you get the balance right, you can really control how much the, the paint will disperse into the water uh, or into the existing wash. You can really have a lot of control over that. Um, the thicker the paint is, the less it will spread out. Uh, the wetter it is, it'll just blend into the wash and you wouldn't even notice it. And now I'm putting in that window here uh, using a dry brush. Um, just to add some details to the window. We're, I think, two-thirds um, two thirds into the this uh, process itself. Um, just generally speaking, the entire thing. Um, but it is, when you paint, it's, it feels like you don't know how, how through into the, the process you are. Um, so we really take your time with that and don't worry if it feels like if it takes a long time or you know sometimes you have to be patient i'm saying this because this was really an issue that affected me uh, over the last few years i would be a little um impatient to finish a painting in one sitting and you shouldn't you can just set it aside and do it tomorrow uh, it works really well and yeah uh, so now I'm going back uh, under that arch and I'm trying to push the shadow to be a little red. Um, I don't even know why I decided to go with red, but uh, it just looked good for me. Uh, now notice also how, uh, because again, I, I used a lot of wet paint, it kind of blended together and mixed together. Uh, the details that I'm going to put in in just a few moments, uh, and now as well, will really pull this together. So you don't have to worry about things blending in in the beginning. I would actually be more worried about someone working too slowly and getting all of these blossoms constantly like you see to the, to the left of where my brush was just at right now there's a bit of cauliflowers blossoms blooms whatever you want to call it um, I see people that constantly get these and they get very streaky washes almost as if they work with oils with watercolor it's not the same you have to work wet that's that's what it's made for you have to work wet and to allow the paint time to merge with its surrounding uh, so it's a matter of, I think, finding the balance, and this is actually an interesting topic, finding the balance between how large of a wash you can handle and how detailed you can get and how, how detailed you want to get. Because a lot of artists, and you see this with many impressionistic artists like uh, uh, Joseph Zbokovic and such and co, um, that they tend to always have this very first wash that covers everything up. And you don't have to do that. You can get a lot of details in. There is a really good uh, watercolor painter here in Israel, one of the best, uh, Marek Yanai, his name. He actually has a few videos here on YouTube. Uh, and he gets a lot of details in in the first wash to the extent of finishing a painting with just one wash. Um, and that's another approach. That's another way of going at it. Um, my suggestion is always to try and find your own balance. I feel like this is one thing that really improved with me is that I did start finding my own balance. So for me, I'm less... Un- besides from maybe except for specific scenes... I usually like to have some more details in the first wash. Uh, I find that my best work is when I'm able to suck out more details in the first wash. I'm not like uh, Alvaro Castaneda and Zbukovic, that they really just go wham, wham, put a a very quick wash uh, in there. It works less well for me. It works fantastically for them. For me, not so much. So what I like to do is get... um, a lot of details in the first wash when possible. Sometimes it isn't possible, it's a very complex scene, it's a very, now I felt this was too strong so I'm kind of wetting it down. Uh, Sometimes the scene is too complex to do that. Uh, so I don't. Now notice the characteristics of a good watercolor paper. I actually watered down that uh, line and it didn't even lift uh, the previous layer. It barely created any marks or any like uh, cauliflowers. It just it looks good. So this is why I recommend using a good paper. This is why I always say get away with everything, lime brushes, bad paint. Paper is a bit different. Uh, the paper is what you paint on and it's so sensitive to, to 
to what you put on it and the difference is staggering. Um, so now I'm putting in that nice diagonal shadow that you see here. It's actually a continuation of the shadow from the bottom, at the bottom, uh, left to the window, but I wasn't even making that connection back then. I was just kind of mm -mm, making sure that it's at about a third of that uh, rooftop from the right. Um, so yeah, this I love measurements of thirds and halves and half almost or half and a bit. Um, almost half, you know. Uh, I love measuring, <laughs> generally speaking. Uh, so now uh, I'm just starting with the rooftops here and there, if you look closely you will see these details I'm putting in right now. Um, I think the one thing that separates this work from my other works and makes it, I think, rise above many other uh, works is that this one has really strong mid values, which is the wash I just finished, so that the shadows can really shine through and the highlights can really shine through. Many times what I end up doing is just creating too many um, too many highlight, too many just highlights and dark shadows, and there's nothing in between. And you really have to test yourself and see: uh, Am I getting the values I see properly? And if the if there's really just two values, you know, dark and light, then so be it. But most of the time, it's not like that. Now, I thought about blending because I made a mistake and I did this area a little too far to the left. I thought about blending it, but it would have made a disaster. It would have made it move into the highlighted. Um, wall that's very sunlit and I didn't want that so I just dabbed it and now what I'm gonna do is just connect it to the previous wash by adding a bit of a gentle stroke of paint um, and this is what I did and hopefully it looks better now um, so yeah and now I'm figuring out together with you what I'm trying to do here but so far we have good highlights we have um, we have good mid values and all that's left really is the shadows and if you're if you're in this this kind of situation where you know that's all that's left and all the rest is working properly then that's a very good uh, spot to be in now notice what difference this line makes it's just where the walls meet usually tends to be a very dark area and I wanted to get that in so I uh, kind of added a line but then it was a bit too stark so I just dabbed a bit out of it. Some dab it with their uh, fingers, I sometimes don't like that. You know, doing this video on toxicity <laughs> back in the like episode 5 of the paint or, or 10 or I don't remember um, kind of made me not want to touch paint when possible. Um, even though it's not uh, not that dangerous as far as I'm concerned, uh, as long as you, you know, wash your hands and stuff. But if you're allergic, you never know. Uh, so I prefer not to. Now, notice how the inner part is much darker than this wall that's closer to us. Um, if you look at that thing to the right with the wires moving down and left, there is this edge of the wall that's brown, the wall is white, the edge of the wall is brown, and to the left the archway and all the and the window above it should be really dark. Um, so that's something I'll try to remedy uh, later on uh, just by adding a bit of darkness to there uh, and hopefully it'll work. Uh, and now I'm also adding some more details to that dry brush from earlier. Now that I'm with the rigor brush I can get in some more details um, and hopefully uh, pull this together because I felt like it was working but not uh, entirely. Uh, it's been a long time since I recorded such a long, uh, since I narrated such a long process, uh, so I'm getting used to doing it again. Uh, so sorry if it's a bit weird or I don't know. Uh, again, this line where two walls meet or the wall and the floor meet tend to be darker. Because I have good mid values and good uh, highlights, I can afford using actual lines there. Um, and it will still look decent, you know. Uh, if I had only had the the very light wash, it wouldn't have been a, I wouldn't have been able to get it this gracefully. And now I made a bit of a blooper there. You see, I moved the brush uh, a bit awkwardly, but now I'm covering that up. Um, small mistakes really don't matter as much when you put in the major shapes properly. And with this one, I think this is really what I was able to do. The shapes are large, in the right places, uh, good use of wet and wet when necessary, good preservation of the colors, there's a lot of oranges, a lot of reds, a lot of blues, um, 
And then on top of that, there's dry brush that really adds to the three dimensionality and, and the feeling of interest. Uh, so it really is working for me right now. And, and I, I enjoy this process a lot. It's so funny how random it can be <laughs> that you just never know when a process is going to connect like that. And I'm just happy that I recorded it actually, because I don't obviously record everything I paint. Um, I, I should. I want to. <laughs> I really do. Uh, when I have a studio soon, hopefully I will be able to share a bit more just on a uh, regular basis. We'll see. I have a few crazy ideas, actually. I want to turn this... I don't know. It's something I've been toying around with for such a long time of making this like a daily blog, showing everything I'm doing, everything I'm painting, just really focusing on that. But it's so much work that I need to figure out how I can do that, how I can afford myself the time to do that uh, every day. Um, also, another cool thing is, I don't know if you know this, but Instagram uh, published or posted, I don't know, like launched a new app called uh, IGTV, Instagram TV. Uh, it's really good. It's like uh, Instagram is for shorter videos, you know, up to 60 seconds, I think. Uh, so they allow there up to 10 minutes. So I'm actually starting to post there. So if you're on Instagram, you can find me through Instagram there, uh, or you can actually d download the, the the app itself, the IGTV. I'm there, and I'm I'm gonna start uploading a lot of things there. Uh, I already uploaded some part of the Jordan Peterson portrait, and I think it's a very interesting way of consuming videos because it's uh, using the dimensions of your phone. It's not uh, horizontal; it's vertical. Um, so it's like if you have an iPhone or an Android device, you just look at it. It's really cool. Uh, so definitely check it out. IGTV, uh, Instagram TV. It's a really good one. Uh, and I think they will steal a lot of the users of YouTube over time. So I'm going to do a lot of uh, work there as well, trying to focus on both fronts. Uh, so anyway, I'm not narrating too much of this part because it's the easier part. I'm just drawing what I see. The windows are very thin because they're in the distance. You don't want to go too detailed there. You want to keep them there under the archway behind it, not um, demanding too much attention. You know, it is really important. So now I feel like there's a bit more details to add in here, but we're mostly done. Uh, there's this round window that I didn't do round. I did it square that I'm, I will add a bit more, um, a bit more uh, uh, shadow in it. Um, I'm kind of messed up with the arch on the left, uh, the, the arch above the window. The, I don't know what you would call that exactly, but um, it should be a bit more uh, in perspective. You know, the left part should be much higher than the right part of it. Uh, but in any case, so now you see all of these dry brush strokes really help to pull together the shape of this uh, and to really shape it as something that's three dimensional, create some borders. It's not realistic as much but it's really I think a good impression of what I was looking at. Uh, realism is still something I'm figuring out slowly. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the values. I think this is literally where it's going to end in just a moment. Uh, but really it's all about getting the values right and the drawing accurate. It's still something I'm trying to figure out. It's not easy at all for me still uh, to get the realistic impression. Uh, maybe I should draw more slowly or more accurately. Who knows? Uh, but I hope to get the balance with time, you know, the whole impressionistic, realistic balance uh, properly. And we are almost done. I'm going to show you in just a few moments the final result. And I really hope you enjoyed uh, this process. I hope you learned something new. I feel like there's a lot to learn from this one. Uh, it all connected pretty nicely. Edges, shapes, composition, uh, colors, temperature, um, all of these good elements of watercolor painting, I think, worked in my favor there. Uh, here's the final result compared to the reference. Let's wrap it up. Okay, so this is it. And as I signed this, I thought I'd do a small conclusion. Uh, I hope this video helped you and I hope you uh, better understand how to utilize warm and cool colors. And generally, I think temperature uh, temperature in your paintings. Uh, this is something again. I'm also still experimenting with learning. It takes time um, And it, it takes a lot of I think focused effort and experimentation and I guess the willingness to to wet <laughs> I guess the willingness to experiment um, and try out new things uh, And treating it I guess as an investment uh, Not assuming that you'll make successful results now uh, but figuring out that uh, down the line, all of this practice and experimentation will help. Uh, sometimes I like to experiment with things that I know will go wrong and will not work. Uh, just for the off chance that maybe I will learn something new and, uh, you know, something like that. Uh, so in any case, this is it. I'm also very pleased with the final result. I think it has a good... 
kind of tunnel feeling. I think there's a good sense of depth. Uh, I like the, the contrast between the very wet areas and then the dry ones. I think even though I didn't try vehemently to control every aspect of it, it turned out uh, pretty much the way I wanted it to. Uh, and this is it. I hope you enjoyed this one. Let's wrap it up. So this is it. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. Here's again the final result of this. Uh, very pleased with how this turned out. Uh, and again, the colors and the temperature plays such an important role here. Um, alongside, I guess, good large shapes and an interesting composition. Uh, I like the way this arch works. There's this L kind of shape. Uh, it just works. So this is it. I hope this will at least make you uh, think more about the temperature itself. Um, I'm doing this experiment of dropping my um, being color specific. I'm dropping that concept for just a few paintings and testing out uh, playing around with the temperature and disregarding the paint completely while maintaining the necessary values. Okay, um, And it's a really interesting experiment and I like the results so far and I think it's very freeing to just drop the whole uh, notion of colors and try and give more depth to the uh, or more thought to the whole color temperature. Okay, and I think uh, even if you decide for a few paintings to drop uh, specific colors or, or thinking about colors in that way, it doesn't mean you commit to it, it's just an experimentation. And these experimentations can be very beneficial. So you take a break for two weeks and only focus on that. And then when you finally allow yourself to go back to the way you worked before, you will have this new knowledge integrated in you and you will bring the best of it, hopefully, to what you already knew how to do. Okay, so this is how I see these kinds of experimentations. I hope you really enjoyed this video. If you want to learn how to draw like this, check out my uh, beginner's drawing course in the description box below. Uh, I will put there, uh, it's like uh, if you get it, you get also my how to shade course for a major discount. I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, you get access to me, you can ask me some questions, it's like we can email back and forth. Um, and if you need, uh, like if you want some critique or things like this. Uh, and this is it. Also, I'll, I will put links to my uh, podcast and to my Patreon page and to my Instagram account and everything else if you want to see works in progress and things of that nature. And this is it. I really hope you enjoyed this one and I will see you again in another vid real soon.